I want to thank on our staff uh, Ken Ward, Leslie Tobias Olson, Jeremy uh, Mumford, and Margo Nishimura, who uh, attended many meetings with me to think about this site. And we built upon the previous bibliographical work of Michael Hammerly. And we're hoping to disseminate that work in new forms uh, in, in years ahead. And I'm grateful to all the Peruvians I met with yesterday, Jose de la Puente and, and others. Um, and I'm also grateful to other friends who can't be here today. Uh, Maria Rana, a uh, Peruvian American, was a visiting scholar a few years ago. And she put me in touch with Peru's former ambassador to the US, Ricardo Luna, who in introduced me to a friend of his named Felipe uh, Ortiz uh, Zevallos, who invited me to Peru in uh, November, and had a wonderful, wonderful trip to Lima. And all of these ideas accelerated uh, quickly during that visit. And I, the culmination of that visit was uh, a short drive over to the US Embassy, where I met Ambas Ambassador Rose uh, uh, Likens. And she could not have been more supportive of all the things we're doing. And her staff is really um, dedicated to the advancement of the relationship, and including these futuristic ways in which we're trying to reach more people than we've ever been able to reach before. So I'm thrilled that she can speak to us live from Lima. And um, that is the, the new frontier we're crossing today. We can be in several places in this hemisphere at the same time. Uh, ambassador Likens uh, has been ambassador to Peru from the United States since 2010. Prior to that, she was uh, ambassador to El Salvador from 2000 to 2003. And uh, within the State Department, she was acting assistant secretary of political Mil military affairs from 2005 to 2010. Prior to that, she was uh, deputy executive secretary of the State Department and deputy chief of mission in Sofia, Bulgaria uh, in the late 1990s. She's an alumna of Mary Washington College in Virginia, where she has a BA in Spanish. And um, she's a lifelong. Uh, uh, employee of the Foreign Service and a deep student of this relationship. So I'm very grateful to her for speaking to us today. And with that, let me turn things over live from Lima to Ambassador <laughs> Likens. Thank you all so much. And thank you, Ted, for, for that introduction. This is really an exciting day for us. And I want to congratulate everybody at the John Carter Brown Library and the entire team that had made this possible. Um, when Ted came to visit us at the embassy last year, kind of on his own initiative, we were so excited to hear about this website and to hear about the possibility of opening a new corridor for the relationship between Peru and the United States. Um, I think this effort really represents kind of the best of American academic life the best traditions of sharing knowledge from our country and around the world. So this is really an exciting day for us. We look forward to, to working with the library to make this very broadly known across Peru. We anticipate, I know it's already getting a lot of attention in Peru, and we want to help you make sure that as many people as possible know about this site and, and are able to make use of this tremendous resource. Um, Obviously, this is a, a treasure trove of information, and it's just you know going to be a huge advance in the ability of Peruvians to have access to these documents and to incorporate it into the, the scholarly work that goes on here in Peru. I know that your panel today is going to have you know a terrific group of people, um, Carlos Galvez Peña from William and Mary. Um, Teodoro Jante Martinez from the San Marcos University here in Peru, and Jose de la Fuente Funke from the Catholic University here in Peru. Um, we also want to acknowledge Jeremy Robbie Moonford from Brown's University, um, the Brown University's Department of History. So we are all engaged in a, in a common task, you know, building the bridges between this hemisphere and within this hemisphere, Peru, the United States, and all of the neighbors. You know, more than five centuries after the arrival of Europeans in the New World, it's even more clear the role that history plays in shaping our lives. And that's why repositories like the John Carter Brown Library are so important to all of us in understanding that history, learning the lessons, and applying them to the challenges in our modern world. Clearly, the John Carter Brown Library is one of the strongest holdings on the planet. Um, 
and the statistics are just impressive. I was looking over them last night, and, and the idea that you know in this collection you hold 20% of everything that was produced in Peru in the, the colonial period is just phenomenal. The idea that in one institution you would have such a rich reflection of Peru's history and what was going on in this part of the world at that time. We look forward to, to helping make the connections that will help Peruvians take advantage of this rich, rich resource. We want to congratulate Jeremy Mumford, Ken Ward, Leslie Tobias Olson for their work on the site, and Mike Hammerley for his superb bibliographical work on the holdings. Um, thank you to David Rum. Rumsey for his visionary leadership of the John Carter Brown Library Board, and especially thanks to Ted and his initiative to, to come in and sit down and tell me about this great project. So again, congratulations. Um, look forward. I'm going to hang around a little while and, and listen to some of the panel discussion. Um, but again, congratulations, and thank you so much for letting us be part of it. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And with that, why don't we have Carlos Galvez Pena and the panel come uh, start their deliberations. Thank you again. Um, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for being today, tonight, well, this afternoon with us. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Margo, for the idea of uh, this panel, originally to be shared with Katie Sampek and the Hadians, but we decided that um, even we are still friends, <laughs> we can go several ways. Um, and we are all very much honored by the words, the kind words of Ambassador Likings. Um, and I also think that this is a, a huge moment in the history, in the cultural, uh, in the history of the cultural relations, uh, relationship between the United States and uh, Peru. Um, this panel celebrates as well the uh, launch of this wonderful site on uh, Peruviana <laughs> within the um, collection of uh, um, colonial Latin America in the John Carter Brown Library. Um, well, among the many reasons that we have um, today, um, um, well, that we, we, we celebrate today, unfortunately we have a sad and a new, which is uh, that Pedro Givovich could not make it uh, from Cusco to Lima, and therefore he cannot join us uh, this afternoon. But um, we're all here, and uh, certainly um, we will try to make up for uh, his absence. Um, well, uh, without much further ado, I would like to introduce our first um, panelist, um, Jeremy Manfort. Jeremy got his PhD at the University of Yale, and uh, he is uh, currently a visiting assistant professor at the history department here at Brown University and the academic projects associate at the JCBL. And his uh, book, Vertical Empire, The General Resettlement of Indians in the Colonial Andes, is um, coming out very soon. So we are glad for him and for all the um, Andeanists and colonialists. <clears throat> and he will make up a presentation on the importance of the uh, Peruvian collection, the digital Peruvian collection at the John Carter Brown Library. Thank you very much to Carlos and for um, Ted and everyone who organized this conference. It's a privilege to be here. The title of these short remarks are, uh, is um, how did this small building in a provincial New England city become one of the world centers for early Peruvian books? And uh, to try to explain this, I did a little bit of reading in the library's manuscript accession books, the annual reports, the institutional histories, and especially in conversations with the curator of Latin American books, Ken Ward whose knowledge of the library's history is uh, unrivaled and who's uh, sort of an unofficial co-author of these remarks. 
Um, very briefly, I want to give a sense of how this collection came to be and why it's important by focusing on four years, four moments in its history. Uh, the first is, of course, 1846. As uh, Bernard Balin told us so beautifully last night, John Carter Brown began collecting Americana in a sunburst of buying in that year. Um, he did this through the agency and with the advice of Henry Stevens, GMB, BBAC, as we learned from these uh, this very peculiar credentials that uh, Henry Stevens claimed. Uh, and as, as Professor Balin explained, others were buying Americana at the same time, but few others had the um, hemispheric vision of what that meant that John Carter Brown had. Um, as Relena Adorno uh, has written about and others, many New England scholars and educated uh, gentlemen of leisure of his generation in New England were f um, fascinated with the Hispanic world. Um, it was the period of Washington Irving's books, The Histories of Christopher Columbus and the Conquest of Granada, George Tickner's History of Spanish Literature, and above all, um, the historian William Prescott's Histories of Ferdinand and Isabella and the Conquest of Mexico and the Conquest of Peru. So it was a moment, especially in New England, of a sort of fer a ferment of interest in Spain and Spanish America. And it was in this context that John Carter Brown developed his vision of Americana that was not only British, but French, Portuguese, and Spanish. The large collection that he bought in 1846 included, alongside treatises of Roger Williams, the poems of Anne Bradstreet, and the histories of Cotton Mather, other authors such as Las Casas, Vitoria, Oviedo, Peter Martyr, Gomera, Elinca Garcilasa de la Vega, um, uh, Bernal Diaz, uh, Costa Solorzano, four volumes of the Recopilación de las Leyes de Indias, um, the letters of Port Cortez, and even records of uh, colonial church councils, a kind of smorgasbord of uh, Spanish Americana. Um, and of this collection, about 200 of these books uh, were printed in South America, the vast majority in Lima. Over half of them um, were focused on the period of independence. Uh, about over half were published between 1808 and 1830 and dealt with the wars and the aftermath of independence. But many others um, were earlier. They included sermons, the theological treatises, medical books, including a crucial his, uh, study of the disease of syphilis, which was a uh, topic of much concern in the early modern Atlantic world. Um, an account of the Lima earthquake in 1746, a metrical and heroic dialogue between Spain and America, and other um, early uh, Peruvian books. The most valuable um, was the epic poem Arauco Domado of Pedro de Oña, um, which uh, was um, published in Lima in 1596. It was a response to a more famous poem La um, Araucana, uh, Araucana, published in uh, 1569 by, uh, by Alonso de Ercilla. But um, unlike that book, Arauco Domada was published in Lima, probably the first book of Bellet written and published in the New World. Um, it cost 10 pounds, 10 shillings. By contrast, the first edition of Roger Williams' Key into the Languages of America um, cost two pounds and 15 shillings. Depending on how you calculate inflation, and this is rather uh, controverted, 10 pounds, 10 shillings was worth somewhere between uh, 1,000 and 20,000 pounds today. There's quite, quite a bit of discrepancy. Uh, my favorite uh, calculation, I was looking on, online at various different uh, websites for currency conversion. My favorite gave it very precisely as $1,055.56 um, for, uh, for this book. So Peruvian books were clearly one of the um, important parts, one of the most important parts of this collection of Americana at the beginning. The second date I want to talk about is um, just a few late years later in 1851. Beginning in that year and through the early 1850s, uh, John Carter Brown's buying took a new direction. Um, he began to focus on books dealing with the evangelization, the Christian evangelization of um, Peruvian Indians many books in or about the indigenous languages Quechua and Aymara. This, um, this new focus, I, I think you can look at it from a couple different points of view. 
One of them is simply bibliophilic. Um, the origin of printing in South America, in Lima, um, came out of the need to publish books um, in and about indigenous languages for the sake of evangelization. The, um, the first uh, Lima printer came from Mexico precisely for this purpose and um, to publish a, a series of handbooks um, directed by the third council, um, church council of Lima. Um, uh, books of sermons, catechism, uh, d uh, dictionaries, and grammars in Quechua and Aymara. Um, but there was a, a, another reason, um, oh, and so, and so in this period, um, besides these very, very early books um, that came out of the press in the 1580s, um, John Carter Brown also um, bought a, um, uh, the most famous classic uh, Quechua dictionary published in 1607, um, a guide uh, to extirpating Indian idolatry by Ariaga, considered today to be one of the most um, used today, not so much for the purpose of extirpating idolatry as <laughs> trying to understand, quote unquote, <laughs> idolatry. Um, a, a, a famous set of, crucially important set, set of Quechua sermons published in um, 1648. Um, a ritual formulario, that is a, a, a sort of liturgical guide in Quechua Aymara published in 1631. Um, and uh, and, and um, some of the books that were published by Jesuits in what was the only other printing press for, um, for a, a long time to come in South America, which was in the small Indian community of Juli on the shores of Lake Titicaca, where the Jesuits created a press, a printing press, to publish uh, Aymara language materials. Um, the, so, um, in other words, well before the end of the 19th century, the, the JCB was a major world center for a very specific topic, uh, what historian Alan Durston calls pastoral Quechua. The literature in, in Quechua, and to some extent in Aymara languages, produced by the Catholic Church and as a form of um, co coercing, evangelizing, and in some sense uh, creating a dialogue with uh, the native Andes. Um, not coincidentally, this came after, short, immediately after the publication in 1847 of um, William Prescott's uh, account of the conquest of Peru, something that Professor Adorno has also written about quite a bit, a, a, a major book of historical scholarship in the United States that created a sort of fascination and romance with the indigenous peoples of the Andes that was yet another force, I think, that shaped um, this collection at John Carter Brown Library. The third date I want to talk about is 1912. In that year, the JCB librarian, George Parker Winship, discovered among a group of Peruvian pamphlets a four-page document called the Pragmatica sobre los diez días del año. This was an instruction from Spain to Peru to implement Pope Gregory XIII's reform to the calendar. Um, that was uh, after m uh, many centuries of the Julian calendar that was gradually falling behind the solar, solar year, um, the uh, Pope decided that by adding 10 days to the calendar and by creating the institution of the leap year, we could now have a calendar that would function um, rationally. Um, uh, for whatever reason, the English-speaking world felt uncomfortable with this kind of newfangled invention and didn't adopt it until 1752. Um, but in um, 1586, this news reached Peru and was published by the printing press in Lima. What Winship discovered was this was actually the very first thing published in Lima. They, they were getting ready to publish these Indian language uh, church materials, and they literally stopped the presses to get off this, um, this document about reforming the calendar. And, and this was an extraordinary dis discovery of the JCB's head librarian, later confirmed by the great Chilean bibliographer, um, uh, Toribio uh, Medina. Um, Jose Toribio Medina, that in a sense put the JCB library on the map, not only as a, as a repository, but as a center for scholarship on Peruvian books. The fourth date, jumping ahead, is 1938. In that year, the library received a gift of 133 books printed in or about Peru from the family of Jesse Metcalf, the wealthy Rhode Island industrialist and philanthropist, whose name is on many buildings throughout the state um, especially Rhode Island School of Design, and I think Brown University as well. 
Jesse Metcalf was a United States senator and a rock-ribbed Republican, part of the Republican establishment that controlled the state for many decades. At the height of the New Deal, in what was called Rhode Island's bloodless revolution of 1935, the Democrats finally ousted the Republicans at every level of the state government and federal representation, and Metcalf, among many others, lost his seat. In these years of disappointment, perhaps seeing their star go into eclipse, the Metcalfs made a number of major donations, including their um, collection of 133 early Peruvian imprints to this library. Um, and their, their collection suggested a kind of ancien regime sensibility. Along with rare papal indulgences, it included vice regal legislation on matters of mining, taxation, tobacco, <coughs> it coerced Indian labor, and the Inquisition. The library's annual report noted that uh, um, Americans, quote, reared on the stately pages of Prescott, unquote, knew fairly little about the later history of Peru after the Spanish conquest, quote, finding it hard to remember that life did not come to an end in South America with the tragic exit from the stage of the Pizarros and their immediate followers. But there as elsewhere, time refused to stand still. You can almost hear a sigh from the JCB's librarian, <laughs> reflecting on the ascendancy of Rhode Island's Portuguese, Italian, and French Canadian immigrants who stubbornly insisted on voting for Democrats. Perhaps even a sense that the fate of the Pissarros and their followers presaged that of the great New England capitalists and perhaps the Brown family itself. Um, the final date that I want to talk about is, is today, 2012. The Peruvian collection has, has been growing uh, very rapidly and continuously ever since. And today it has uh, 1,072 imprints and counting. Um, but there are three milestones that we have either just passed or that are happening right now. Um, first of all, in uh, 2011, the library bought a collection of 90 new items, many of them the only known copies. Um, and among, uh, this was in a set. And separate from that and immediately after that, um, among other uh, recent acquisitions, just a few months ago, at the end of the last calendar year, the JCB published the first Quechua dictionary printed in the New World printed in Lima in, 18, in um, sorry, 1586. Uh, the authorship of the book has been disputed. It's been traditionally um, attributed to the great Dominican friar Domingo de Santo Tomas, friend and ally of Bartolomé de las Casas and a great um, Quechuólogo. Um, it was the fifth item printed in Lima, meaning that we now hold all, all of the first five imprints of Lima. Um, in fact, of South American imprints in the 16th century, the JCB holds more than any other institution in the world, um, to, and uh, two of these are the only known copies. The second milestone is that, there, um, as Ted mentioned, it uh, has just been arranged that uh, Michael T. Hammerley's uh, exhaustive uh, annotated bibliography of the JCB's Peruvian holdings, which is really an encyclopedia of uh, Peruvian imprints through the JCB is going to be published simultaneously in Peru and the United States. Um, and third, most importantly for this panel, is the digitization um, mm -hmm. of the Peru collection. Um, the, uh, the, the, the JCB several years ago decided to digitize the entire Peru collection and put it online via the site Internet Archive. And the um, website Sources of Peru on the JCB's webpage is a kind of front door to that site. That, that, hi that highlights and discusses um, some of the, the great crown jewels of the collection and points to the um, full original facsimiles on the Internet Archive. Um, along with the Haitian collection, these are the first fruits of the great impetus and generous help given to the library by David Rumsey um, and, um, and also to the commitment of Ted Widmer, who spearheaded these two sites and um, this, the vision that they share of bringing the JCB's collections to students in, in all over the world, and also as teaching tools for school teachers, um, so that everyone, anyone with an internet connection um, will be able to study and teach the masterpieces of, uh, including of their own countries um, who live far from any research library, uh, and including books that tragically are no longer available in the countries where they were printed, but are available um, as the jewels of the John Carter Brown Library. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Jeremy. Um, our next presenter is Teodoro Jante Martinez. Teodoro got his uh, PhD at the University um, Universidad Complutense de Madrid. I will not translate that. <laughs> and among several books and, and works, he um, has recently um, authored um, El, Mira El Mirador Peruanista, which is a collection of um, essays and articles on um, Peruvian colonial cultural history. And um, he has also edited um, the scientific legacy of Alexander von Humboldt in Peru. So, Teodoro. Thank you very much, dear Ted, uh, dear colleagues. Due to the critical limitations of time, I uh, have been forced to restructure a bit the presentation I wanted to give you in this afternoon, uh, which would have concentrated on Simon Bolivar and the materials regarding his life and politics at the new Peruvian digital collection at the JCB. I will uh, speak about Bolivar a bit, but mainly using the images that will follow afterwards. In the first part of my uh, paper, I would like to stress the historical relations between Peru, my home country, and the JCB. In the second part, I would like to speak about, in general, about the Bolivar collection at the JCB, and the third part will be constituted by the images. The John Carter Brown Library has, along with uh, Lima, Santiago de Chile, Madrid, and New York City, one of the five largest collections of early Peruviana in the world. It is not just the number of Peruvian imprints of the colonial, independence, and early national periods held by the JCB that is important, however, but the diversity of those materials and, in a great many instances, their singularity, being only known copies. The subjects range from ecclesiastical matters to government papers to indigenous language studies and important literary works. The vast majority of you know well that the origins of this library go back to the middle of the 19th century when a wealthy businessman from Rhode Island, John Carter Brown, began systematically collecting printed texts before American independence. In 1846, the year that marks its very beginning, he acquired a copy of the first Latin edition of the letter of Columbus to the Catholic kings, announcing that he had discovered a new route to the land of spices. The steady increase of his holdings allowed Brown to edit a couple of decades later the Biblioteca America in three volumes, 1865 to 71, a catalog of his private collection of books relating to the colonization of this hemisphere. On John Carter Brown's death, the library gathered about 7,000 titles of extraordinary value. His personal archives contain, as might be expected, the correspondence that he and his closest uh, dependents had with the most distinguished bibliographers of the time, Rich, Harris, Stevens, Dedication to collect evidences of the colonial experience in the New World was continued by his eldest son, John Nicholas Brown. Apart from significantly augmenting the collection with the rare and richly bound volumes, he conceived the fortunate idea of uh, putting this private library available to a scientific community. By his will, he donated all the books made a bequest of uh, $500,000 for maintenance of the collecting activity and allocated an additional amount for the construction of suitable premises. The John Carter Brown Library, as you know it, housed in a super building on Brown University's campus, officially opened its doors on May 17, 1904. In a brief essay called Peruvianism in Rhode Island, I have studied the particular relationship between the JCB and my home country. The most ancient guest book contains, for instance, the signatures of Peruvianist Hiram Bingham, the discoverer of Machu Picchu in 1906. Erudite historians like Charles F. Loomis and Charles Marshall H. Saville, 1910. The Mexican bibliographer Nicolas Leon, 1912, 
and anthropologist Philip Ainsworth Means, a researcher of the history of Andean civilization in 1916. To the first historian of the institution, George Parker Winship, Peruvian historiography owes a couple of outstanding contributions, and Jeremy has already mentioned one of these. It was he who announced the existence of the Pragmática sobre los diez días del año, a rustic ordinance published in Lima by Antonio Ricardo in, 50, in 1884, 50, sorry, in 1584, which he revealed to be the first printed text in South America. In addition, he edited a series of uh, 80 early numbers of the official newspaper of the Vice Royalty, the Gaceta de Lima, covering the years 1744 to 1763. Both of these contributions by Winship were based, of course, on the treasures of the Americanist collection here in Providence. But Brown's repository includes many other fundamental pieces to explore the colonial history of Peru. With respect to printed materials, it holds more than 50 of the so-called Peruvian incunabula. It is all kinds of books and pamphlets published in the Viceroyalty before 1650. There is a trilingual catechism, confessional, and uh, seminary in Castilian, Quechua, and Aymara, prepared by order of the Council of Lima, next to several grammars and vocabularies of indigenous languages, historical narratives, and religious and legal treatises created by the wisest savants of the time. Notwithstanding the wealth of this documentation, until about 20 years ago, few Peruvian researchers had come up to Rhode Island to investigate in such an excellent repository. I myself first arrived here in the fall term of 1989 as a beneficiary of the fellowship program of the John Carter Brown Library. I came then with the purpose to complete a study on intellectual diffusion in 17th century Peru, which resulted in the publication of two books, two books along the next years. And now let's move to Simon Bolivar is a particular example of the collections of the JCB, digitalized and not. The John Carter Brown Library received in the fall of 1996 North America's largest and most historically significant collection of original writings by Simon Bolivar, the liberator of Andean America. The uh, Bolivar collection and I will just uh, show you uh, some of the uh, portraits which are to be seen at the Brownson Bolivar Room in the, J in the JCB Library before showing you some examples out of the digital archives. These are portraits of Bolivar from different instances in his life. Okay, and this is Maury Brownson. The Bolivar collection consists of more than 40 items, including books, 22 manuscripts, paintings, engravings, and other materials. The collection was a gift from Maury A. Bromson, 1919 to 2005, a distinguished antiquarian and book collector in Boston. President Vartan Gregorian announced the Bromson gift at the Brown University Convocation of November 14, 1996, celebrating the 150th anniversary of the founding of the library. Bromson's Bolivar collection was exhibited at the Boston Public Library in 1983 at the bicentennial of Bolivar's uh, birth. And a portion of it was exhibited at the JCB in 1995 under the title Simon Bolivar and the Revolutions for Independence in the Americas. Bromson, a bibliographer, historian and book dealer, as well as a collector, specialized in co the colonial Latin American field for more than 50 years. In addition to the gift of the Bolivar collection, he announced a bequest to establish an endowment for Latin American studies at the library, intended to underwrite a special curator for Latin Americana and provide funds for acquisitions, publications, research, and lectures in the field. The uh, Bolivar Oh, sorry, the Brahms and Bolivar room adjacent to the JCB main reading room was officially opened in March of 2000 with an address by the Venezuelan ambassador of the United States. Let's uh, present some of the 
materials which have been already digitalized and which are uh, disposal at the JCB website. Uh, this, most of them come from the uh, uh, Brownson uh, collection, of course. This one here is the front page of the uh, booklet containing a series of manuscripts uh, pertaining to Bolivar's life and, and times. Uh, it has been done, of course, in, in modern times, so by somebody making an index of titles and uh, places where the, where the manuscripts were done or, or, or printed in the year of publication or writing. Here are some examples. Uh, this is a writing by uh, Santander, uh, one of the collaborators of Simon Bolivar in uh, Colombia, dating from the year 1820. Another one, it's a discourse uh, celebrating the entrance of Simon Bolivar in Lima in the year of uh, 1823, actually, although published the year afterwards. This is a very interesting short document uh, uh, regarding or making news about the victory of the Patriot, uh, patriotic uh, troops in Ayacucho in 1824, which we know was the seal and battle of the Latin American independence. And this is a poem also celebrating uh, a libertador the, to the liberator of Colombia and Peru. It means uh, Simon uh, Bolivar. Another one, uh, this is a frontispiece of a uh, um, pamphlet published in Arequipa. So we, we can, you can also see that the, many of these uh, 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 texts are not only published in the capital or the former vice royalty, but also in small or relatively small cities like Trujillo and Arequipa in Peru. Thus uh, being uh, some of the uh, oldest uh, printed matter materials of those uh, places uh, known up to now. And I will uh, show you, uh, I mean, with more attention, this document called the Exposición, uh, que hace Benito Lazo, diputado del Congreso por la provincia de Puno, uh, of which I will make a quotation prior to getting up to the end of my paper. Like uh, George Washington, Simon Bolivar, 1783 to 1830, was a member of the slave-owning colonial aristocracy of his country. He came from a rich and powerful family of Caracas with investments in agriculture, ranching, and sugar mills, along, along with many other talented Creoles throughout the Western Hemisphere, he resented the ceilings and limitations that European government from overseas placed on advancement by those who were not themselves Europeans. <laughs> Profoundly influenced by the ideas of the French Enlightenment, Bolivar was a rare instance of the intellectual who was also a man of action. He was a firm believer in legal equality for all men, regardless of class or color. He was opposed to slavery and freed his own slaves in 1821. He saw that the freedom of America from Spanish control required a complete conquest of the royalists, lest the base remain on the continent from which a counter-revolution could be launched. In this specific text, the exposición that Benito Lasso, a well-known liberal politician and representative of the province of Puno, made to the Peruvian parliament in 1826, we find an almost desperate petition for Bolivar's maintenance in the country where his presence should stand for stability and order. Lasso's rhetoric is quite outstanding and includes a curious comparison between the Venezuelan Creole and George Washington as preeminent figures in the dependencies of both South and North America. The text finishes with the following invocation. I will show to you the original in Spanish, but I will quote it, quote it in a free English translation of mine. It says, Bolivar, I speak to you on behalf of Peru because I am a Peruvian. I beseech, beseech you for the sake of my homeland to support us with your presence and direction. Your beneficial hand shall accompany us throughout the dangerous, dangerous path that you have opened for ourselves. You gave us the political life. You must give us the conservation. If, unfortunately, your moderation would lead you to entirely abandon Peru, 
leaving us involved in the disorder, you would have committed a crime when you gave us freedom. Like a father would have begotten a child to expose him at birth to the rigorous elements and the voracity of beasts. This crime would be unforgivable in the court of nature. But no, you have committed your word. You have uh, sworn to encourage us. Live, therefore, believer, further in our hearts than on our soil. Live for the South more than Washington for the North. Let your glory be in peace largest than the one you have acquired in war. Thus your name will be the blessing of religious man. End of quote. And the last sentence. It is unquestionable that the greatest figure in the revolutions for independence in Spanish America, both in eloquence and in military leadership, was Simon Bolivar. He died, however, in disillusionment with the results of his heroic efforts. Everywhere in the region he saw chaos and political instability. Few of his plans for social, economic, and political reform were realized. Well, only one month before he died near Santa Marta, Colombia, in December 1830, he wrote to a friend, America is ungovernable. Those who serve the revolution plow the sea. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Teodoro. The next presenter uh, is Jose de la Puente Brunque, professor of history at the Pontifical Catholic University of Lima. Uh, Jose de la Puente got his PhD at the University of Seville, Spain, and among many other books and articles uh, of importance for the history of colonial Peru, he um, is author, he's the author of the massive Encomienda and Encomenderos en el Perú Colonial. Today, Jose will make some um, comments on the importance of um, JCBL sources for the legal history on the eve of independence in Latin America. Good afternoon, dear Ted, dear colleagues and friends. I'm very glad to be here. And the idea of my presentation is to uh, state or underscore some ideas concerning the richness of the sources of the John Carter Brown Library, concerning the Peruvian history, and especially concerning uh, legal history, and especially on, uh, in the times of independence. Uh, but uh, I want to begin my presentation with a, small, a very brief remark concerning the first document that I found here when I arrived in my, during my fellowship in January 2007, which is a very strange, very rare text in which a judge of colonial Peru explains the motivations of his resolutions in a time when those explanations were not mandatory because during the colonial period, the arbitrio of the judge, uh, his uh, uh, own uh, criterion, I don't know how to, Jeremy, how to translate arbitrio. Criterion, yeah. His criterion uh, was very, uh, was fundamental and more important than uh, written law or uh, any other source. So uh, this document, which has a very strange title, Estatera Jurídica, Balanza en que se pesan los fundamentos legales. I don't know how to, how to translate Estatera, but Balanza is a... Uh, scale. Yes, a scale, yes. In order, in order to uh, uh, consider the importance of uh, uh, the legal arguments. No? So this, this um, a document, this text, who was uh, written by Pedro Garcia de Ovalle, a judge, a oidor from the Audiencia of Lima, uh, was very important. It's, it's a very important document and a very rare document of the JCB. But um, I want to um, refer my presentation to the changes uh, in the juridical aspects uh, in the times of independence. And I want to begin my presentation uh, recalling what Professor Bernard Bailing uh, stated uh, last night uh, when he uh, underscored the importance of the derecho natural, the natural law, and he uh, quoted, he cited the work of uh, the famous Argentinian professor 
Jose Carlos Chiaramonte, who was a fellow here uh, as well. Uh, Chiaramonte's work is very important in order to underscore the, the importance of natural law in these uh, years uh, prior to the independence. Um, in the John Carter Brown Library, uh, we have lo many documents concerning uh, the juridical thinking of those times and especially the importance of natural law. For example, I want to uh, cite only two of them. Uh, well, first of all, a, a very important text, uh, a very important imprint, which is the Bases de la Constitución Política del Perú, the, the fundamentals, the basis of uh, the first conti constitution of Peru. The first con constitution is of 1823, and these bases were printed in 1822. And another important document, which is a proclama, like a manifesto no, of uh, Rafael Ramírez de Arellano, a Peruvian aristocrat, uh, which title, the title is Los Verdaderos Hijos de la Nación Son Los Amigos de la Constitución. No? The true sons of the nation are the friends of the Constitution. And in this text and in many other texts of those times that are here in the John Carter Brown, we can uh, note the changes uh, in political language. Uh, words as nación, nation, constitution, representación, representation, pueblo, people, soberanía, sovereignty, derechos de los ciudadanos, rights of the citizens, change in their in their sense in in many in many ways. Uh, in this regard, I want to um, cite two very important authors of the time. Uh, the first is Jose Baquijano y Carrillo, we ha, we, who was a criollo nobleman, a, a son of uh, Sp a Spaniard, born in Peru, and Manuel Lorenzo de Vidaure, who was a very important judge and uh, professor. In the John Carter Brown Library, there are four uh, works of Baquijano, and among them, here we have the very famous Elogio on the Virrey Jauregui. It's a speech in praise of uh, the Viceroy uh, uh, Jauregui, uh, who was the Viceroy at the time of the uh, execution of Tupac Amaru II. Uh, he, he arrived months after the execution of Tupac Amaru II. And in this speech in the University of Lima, in praise of this uh, Viceroy, Baquijano uh, uh, made lots of criti very, very hard criticism concerning the abuses of colonial government. This text, the Elogio, was burned uh, by order of the authorities. And here in the John Carter Brown Library, we have one of the very few uh, uh, pieces or copies that were not burned. No? Uh, uh, so it's a, it's a very rare text. And concerning Manuel Lorenzo de Vidal, Manuel Lorenzo de Vidaure is a man of a, the, a next, the next generation of Baquijano. He, he uh, was born 20 years after Baquijano. And uh, here in the John Carter Brown Library, we have 14 works of Vidaure, and including his famous Plan del Peru, which was a very important work, um, plan concerning Peru. Uh, and he's a very important author because he uh, reflects all the change uh, from the absolutist government to liberal government. And he himself was a monarchist, and finally he, he ended as a republican. So he's a, the, the best example, I think, of uh, the ideological and juridical change of those times. Uh, in order to appreciate the changes concerning uh, the juridical uh, thought in those times, it's very important to recall the foundation in 1772 of the Convictorio de San Carlos by Virrey Manuel uh, de Amat. Uh, Vidal said in his Plan del Peru that in the Convictorio de San Carlos, uh, the study of modern philosophy and of natural law uh, will uh, teach children to think in a different way. No? So he underscored the importance of natural law. And this uh, convictorio, this college, uh, was key in the formation of a new generation of jurists. In uh, uh, the times of the Enlightenment, and in times that favored the derecho patrio, uh, the laws uh, uh, done uh, in Peru, and tried to diminish the importance of the study of Roman law and, in general, of the uh, 
uh, European tradition of the use commune. Vidaure and all these authors said that there were two bases for the new uh, Peruvian law, the new derecho republicano, the new republican law. Uh, first of all, the first base, the derecho patrio, the laws uh, proclaimed in uh, Peru, and uh, the derecho natural, the uh, natural law. Uh, Vidaura said that natural law gives a model, a very useful model for the legislature because the just law is precisely the law that hears the voice of nature. Uh, therefore, laws had to be the application of natural law sustained by all the members of the uh, state. Um, Baquijano and Vidaure were part of the small but important group of liberals in the years uh, prior the independence. Uh, these liberals identify themselves with the principles, the, the fundamental principles of the Cortes de Cádiz and of the Constitution of Cádiz uh, that reveal very adequate uh, concerning the uh, basic aspirations of these, of these criollos. Uh, for example, to develop some reforms, but uh, keeping the vinculation with uh, uh, Spain. Uh, Peruvian liber liberals want uh, the application of uh, reforms, but maintain maintaining the order. They wanted political freedom, commercial freedom. They wanted that the criollos had the same rights the, as the Spaniards born in the Peninsula Iberica, in the Iberian Peninsula and they wanted autonomy in the government of the American territories and uh, to put in practice the Union Nacional, the national unity de defended by the Cortes de Cádiz, uh, substituting the, the union in the person of the king that was typical of the uh, absolutism, uh, of the previous uh, absolutism. Besides, uh, liberals uh, with these ideas defended a very clear uh, regionalism uh, and tried to uh, uh, comply with the uh, aspiration of these, of these uh, criollos. Uh, the Constitution of Cádiz established many of the basic principles of the first constitution of Republican Peru and of the other uh, Latin American states. For example, uh, people's sovereignty, um, the free uh, right uh, to the, the right to free speech, the division of powers, uh, the equality uh, for all uh, the citizens, and basically the combination of freedom and uh, order. And uh, many of these authors, uh, precisely, they invoke the combination of freedom and order in relation with the uh, natural law. Uh, Vidaure uh, invoked natural law stating that the rights of men in society are the same rights given by nature. These rights had to be assured by the union among men and the formation of a, a body politic uh, with laws that tr uh, had to translate the uh, orders of uh, nature. Perhaps Vidaure is the author who most clearly stated the differences that with the independence appeared uh, concerning the notion of justice uh, as well. Uh, first of all, Vidaure, who was a judge himself, he defended the arbitrio, the, the, the crit cr a personal return of the judge, but afterwards, he uh, very passionately defended the idea of the judge as aplicador de la ley, as applicator of the law, uh, 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 a judge that uh, had to obey the law over uh, any other uh, consideration. Uh, Vidaure considered fundamental to substitute the old Spanish laws with the promulgation of legislative codes in order to have clear laws and general laws adequate to the republican principles. And he himself uh, published, published two projects of a civil code and of a criminal code. And the publication of his uh, criminal code project was precisely in Boston in 1829. But unfortunately, among the 14 uh, works of Vidaure, here at the JCB, we don't have the, this criminal code. So I think. Uh, you, you have to try to 
to purchase it, no? That, because Boston is so so close to Providence, no? so it would be it would be nice. Um, uh, Vidaure admired the American political system, and he understood this system as a as a better version of the British uh, one, uh, because of the presidentialism that was limited in time, that was based on merit and controlled by laws. Uh, he underscored that the power of the president was not absolute and that he had to work in coordination with the parliament. And because of that, he, uh, 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 he first was a close ally and friend of Bolivar, and finally he was one of the, of the worst enemies of Bolivar because of the fact that Bolivar in the constitution of 1826 tried to establish a presidencia vitalicia mm, uh, on himself. No? The, uh, he wanted to be a, a president for all his life. No? Uh, so uh, in the fundamental points uh, stated by uh, Vidaurre, uh, the idea of understand the political community uh, with a con contractual conception was uh, very important related again, with the principles of natural law. Uh, he saw the republic uh, as a government based on freedom and on the rights of the citizens as well as the obligations of them. Uh, and he uh, understood uh, politics as a reflect of the social unity. And he also stated that religion was the base of the republic even though um, relation what de depended on the state in administrative uh, aspects. Uh, for example, this is a difference uh, with the liberal liberalism of uh, the French thinkers of the time, no? the importance of the church in Latin American uh, constitution. So, uh, Vidaure shows uh, how notorious were changed, uh, were these changed politically, ide ideologically, and juridically in the times of uh, independence. I think he's the author that uh, more clearly uh, uh, explains that uh, uh, those changes. Uh, and finally, with this presentation, I only try to underscore the richness of the uh, uh, sources of the John Carter Brown Library in order to understand this dramatic moment, this dramatic phase of the uh, uh, Latin American history. Uh, and I think that uh, it's uh, uh, very important for all the people, the scholars that investigate these uh, subjects to uh, consult these sources. Thank you. Well, I, I would like to invite um, the presenters to the table so we can maybe answer a couple of questions as a sort of wrap up of this panel. Michael Hammerlitt has a question. Uh, no question, uh, just a few comments. Of the 22 items known to have been printed on Lehman Brothers, only three of them were actually printed. Sixteen are known to have survived, which the JCB holds exactly one half today, more than any other repository in the world. Until, and, and it's not just one-fifth, Regarding the Indian language materials, we now know that there were 44 or 45 items printed throughout the world related to Ipa, Ipa, Amara, Ipa, Moshe. The JCB now holds 36 of those 44. Uh, unrivaled again anywhere in the world. Thank you very much, Michael. We, we needed that precision from you. <laughs> and 
a particular, I think Michael, I mean, very well deserves another, um, um, well, recognition from this panel because it is because of his hard work of many years that the collection is now finally online and accessible to the uh, scholars. A last question. Uh, Malakach, I'm just a question for a uh, very interesting uh, last paper um, on the legal history uh, sources uh, in the JCB. Did you come across, uh, this is really a bibliographical question, um, did you come across in your research any discussions, treatises, uh, reflections on slave law, uh, the law of slavery mm -hmm. in Peru and its relationship to um, the post-colonial order, or just I mean, either in general or specifically in relationship to the post-colonial order? <laughs> no, I don't recall now um, any document or, or book concerning slavery, but I'm, uh, I have to, to, to say that when I arrived here in the John Carter Brown, I uh, did a research on the juridical aspects on 17th century Peru. You know? So uh, basically, I know the sources on those times, and afterwards I was interested in, in independence time. So because of that, I, uh, I, perhaps I didn't find that work. And so in, in, in these invocations of natural law, is the connection made between natural law and uh, the status of slaves? Um, that that you have seen, or is it really is it really abstracted from uh, from from that? Many thing? authors mention natural law in those times, and the merit of Professor Chiaramonte, for example, is to underscore the importance of natural law in the ideological scenario of those times. No, uh, 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 because before many authors uh, underscored the importance of uh, enlightenment, French enlightenment, etc. But natural law is also very important. And uh, obviously, these arguments were used concerning the discussions on slavery. Yes, of course, by, by many authors. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs>